welcome back um, for beginner episode number two. It was a lot of fun the first time, so uh, excited to do this again. Hey, yeah, Martin. me too. It was really great fun last time, so I'm really looking forward about talking about guards. Yeah, yeah. so um, let's kind of jump into it. Um, I think we've got a lot to cover, um, so um, on guard, gentlemen. <laughs> All right, so the Anonymous Bolognese, he says, um, you know, he's got lots of like amazing wisdom nuggets uh and then he he always kind of pulls through uh when you need him to just kind of say something that's profound and he has this one quote on guards where he says but you must utilize this judgment in any guard or placement at which you have set yourself against your enemy because there is always a great variety of attacks that you can make from one of or the other setup and note that you can ruin your guard by just keeping your sword half a finger too high, mm-hmm. too low, or off to one side. Even this is just by a hair's breadth, because the sword passes and enters so many small positions that it boggles the mind. Yeah, going yeah. on. Yeah, I know. So, what? Let's um, let's kind of talk about that for a second. I mean, is this is this like? Do we need to be T boat level? precise with everything that we do with the sword or are we are we thinking is the anonimo just being really just kind of prophetic here all right where do we start so i'm i'm gonna say that the anonimo is right and that there is a absolutely (laughs) proper position into which you place your sword and if you place it the wrong way by a millimeter or two you can totally change the game uh we can get into that more specific uh later um and that essentially, in my experience with the Anonimo, you place the sword and then you build your body position, your guard, around the placement of that sword. Hmm. And that uh, some of the attacks in the Anonimo are then later done when your sword is going, if falling into guard. And that's why we have a great variety of attacks, because depending upon where your hand position is in the previous attack and the guard you're going into, different actions make different sense. Yeah, that's really interesting. Mm-hmm. What do you think, Martin? Yeah, I think so. I'm going with the instructor's bread and butter answer and say it depends. <laughs> <laughs> because, of course, um, it completely depends on what you're trying to achieve with that guard. And in that case, if you have a specific goal in mind and if you divert from that guard in some case or form, then, of course, well, you might present an opening that you didn't thought uh, that was there so that might be really disadvantageous but then again any position that we are in and to quote Vijani like uh, when he says that when you lie calm and settled in some form with arms either in order to attack or defend that that settlement in that position in that composition of the body in that guise in that form I call a guard so there are great many of guards and we are here mainly discussing the ones that the authors like to use but they're of course way more than that yeah um so i i guess my answer is in between it depends and yes so it like if we have like an overton (laughs) square overton window of like where do we all land i'm gonna land like squarely in the middle of youtube um i think that most people i think their problem with sword fighting is that they don't actually parry in guards um, I think that they, they do their best to cover the sword, and they will get their sword in the way of their opponent's attack, but not necessarily that they parry in a guard. Um, and I think, that, I, think, I think that's something as a community we can stand to improve on, um, mostly because I think we see it later on in the tactical advice that Manchilino and Morazzo give, um, where they talk about how every guard should be followed with a counterattack, and that a lot of times these positions that we're forming are formed in a way where they should have a built-in offense um sort of like like you should be forming a position with your body forming a structure where you can Mm -hmm. you can easily counterattack out of it so Mm -hmm. that's how i feel okay yeah might be a hot take there but (laughs) no it doesn't doesn't sound no it sounds I mean, well, certainly for point and line guards, you know, the parries from Guardia Alta are probably a bit limited. Uh, well, yeah, but or like Guardia Alta as a parrying position is probably a bit limited. It's, Although you it's know, not you, a objectively, yeah, like when your you sword is moving up like that, you're in a kind of Guardia Alta position. You can catch that with the false edge there, but yeah, you're definitely for the the Strata guards. That, yeah. That's a pretty apt apt 
description. Yeah, like, I mean, if we were to think about, like, guards is, like, two positions of rest between movement, which is yeah. the way that um, the Gianni kind of describes it. And we'll talk about that when we talk about tempo. Um, but with uh, with this one in particular, you know, like, what you were talking about with Gordia Alta, a lot of times you see that, like, when we were talking about Manchilino before, where you throw that rising falso, that, uh, mm-hmm. that Montante. Um, and yeah. that Montante is usually the action, but it rise, it goes from, it starts in Gordialta and it goes right back to Gordialta. So it's like, right. you know, it's kind of like, it's like you're in between. So, yeah, and right, I think so. that's really important uh, to keep in mind, right? That the guards are the framing points of every action that we can take in that system, basically. Because yeah. every blow will start from a guard, it will end in a guard, and every motion, every engagement of the swords will be in some kind of guard and it's also when you're building out kind of your chain of if then sort of things is the they most of the time people just withdraw and so you need to finish in a guard so you can then begin the next thing because a lot of mm-hmm. times people want to start a compound action but they just back up and then you have to be in a guard to then keep the momentum going yeah, and in that sense, I think the guards are sometimes even more important than the actual text that the authors are using because um, it describes way more precisely where the sword and the body will be at some point in space where the a text can be fairly generic. The guards mm-hmm. are fairly precise and they can also, like I said, uh, frame the action as well and give us some <laughs> additional information about these strikes. Right. Yeah, yeah. Like... I think, and and that's kind of one of the things that I think is really interesting. Like you, you brought up uh, being having a scientific mindset as well, Martin, um, in the last episode, and I I can I can definitely you know see the world through that lens. And you know a lot of times when you're kind of putting together any sort of a scientific study, you you determine your knowns, and when you have variables, it's you want your variables to be in between knowns. And then you try to fill in that information as much as you possibly can. So if you can get to like 75, 80% confidence on your, your middle between your, your solid knowns, then, you know, you start to gain confidence and that's how you actually determine your overall confidence in your theory. Right. And so that's kind of one of the beautiful things about this. And, you know, it's like you were saying, um, you know, if there is some level of variability or even like um, opportunity for, uh, changing things in a way like sometimes it feels like that happens in between like guards right like what does that footwork look like you know that's something you mm-hmm. might be able to kind of play with and manipulate a little bit but the position that you're going into should be no so let's talk about them uh we've got low guards high guards wide guards mm-hmm. what's all the fuss yeah i mean let's um let's kick it off with low guards let's uh let's get low okay um so um Martin, Cotolonga Strata, what's it good for? All right, so um, yeah, let's start with the Cotolonga Guards. So the Cotolonga Guards are protecting basically your outside. So the as a right-hander, the sword would be on your right-hand side. And in Cotolonga Strata specifically, well, it's more of a special guard, to be honest, because um, all these guards have different kinds of um, adjectives describing the height of the hand and maybe the place of the feet. And Colalonga Stretta, especially for, I think, all the authors except the Anonimo, is fairly special in that it's just with the right foot forward and the sword is pointing towards the opponent. Strette or Stretta, in that case, can mean close, can also mean constraint. So there might be some point of either sword in presence. So um, the actions are not free, right? We are always dealing with that danger of the opponent's sword. Yeah, so in conclusion, right foot forward, sword on the outside, point forward. Yeah, how about you, Steven? Um, I have a slightly different take on it. Um, I mean, kind of. So so I kind of think actually the primary, good, the basic guard to understand everything from is Porta di Ferro Stretta. That's basically sword dominating the center, pointing at the bad guy, okay? And I think I'd, I'd like to liken it to chess. So Porta di Ferro Strada, when you're coming into especially side sword alone, is kind of your king's pawn opening. You're like, okay, boom, I'm moving into the center. Okay, and your opponent can respond also with a king's pawn. You get the king's game. 
um, or you can go into Cotalunga Stretta or be in Cotalunga Stretta, and that's sort of like a French defense sort of, I'm not a, sorry, a, a Sicilian defense position where you're essentially besieging uh, your opponent's weapon from the side. So Cotalunga Stretta has a really cool superpower because the angulation of your body goes towards the outside so that if you if they're on your outside, the structure of your body will naturally be pushing against their weapon and they're forced to resist your body with their lame arms. Arms are lame, right? Hips are where the action's all at. But here's the cool part about Cotalunga Stretta. The, wep the sword is held slightly sideways, as the Anonymo specifies, which means that if they then go to the inside, you have... Uh, the angular advantage on the inside as well it really creates a problem for anyone and that's kind of how at least my understanding is you break porte di ferro stretta by going into cota lunga stretta so then you have advantage on either side it's very annoying uh yeah that's my hot take no that's that's actually um i i actually really like that <laughs> <laughs> so uh, because that's uh, trying to think about how deep I wanted to go into this because that's that's how I see the mechanics of something like the Falso and Puntanto working because Pray tell. well because you always see a left foot step out of Cota Longa Strata with the Falso and Puntanto for the most part uh, it's not right. always true but right. for the most part you see a left foot step but it's that you're basically stepping from Cota Longa Strata into Chinghiari Porta de Ferro Strata which is such right. a you're going from kind Such of a hips boss coil. Move. yeah because you're going from yeah. hips coil to the right, right to hips coiled to the left you know that's right it, it's like hips yeah. to the right hips to the left you're like you're just like shifting that body across and you're you're literally putting pressure on your opponent's sword with your core right which is a lot for instead them instead of resist. with your arms yeah right, right. And that's what and makes us different than the rapier kids it, exactly the angulation of the body is what drives um our our art so, yeah, I think it's really important the to stuff. Yeah, yeah, really important to once again talk about the body rotations. Mm -hmm. We touched on it last time when talking about attacks, but especially in these Porta di Ferro and Cola Longa guards, the turn of the body is so essential. So yep. in Cola Longa we have, like you said, the chest forward, chest open kind mm -hmm. of guard, hard pointing forward, or maybe a frontal position, something like that. While in um, Bote di Ferro, we have the profile position with the dominant shoulder pointing forward. Right. So another source I would like to bring in here is also Angelo Vigiani, which mm -hmm. doesn't call yeah. that guard Cola Longa Estreta, but it's actually his seventh guard. And he mm -hmm. calls it offensive, perfect, and uh, Stretta as well. Mm -hmm. So it is still for the close play. It is offensive or, uh, because it's on the right side of the body. So it's on the outside and it's perfect because the point is in presence. So now let's talk a bit about why it's maybe, um, why I think it's uh, an offensive guard. Well, having that potential for the turn of the body. So being in a frontal guard with the right shoulder, so the dominant shoulder turned back, that just gives us some, some range to play with. So if we want to attack, we usually have like the extension of the feet to gain some range. We have Mm -hmm. the um, lifting of the hand to gain some range. But if we are in a frontal position, we can also now turn into a profile position, getting our right shoulder up front and basically getting the half of our body with as an additional range, basically. It's also offensive because, well, while presenting that heart, that chest towards our opponent, well, it entices them to attack as well. Mm -hmm. So we have that these two components, right? We, we are presenting a bigger opening, but we are, can also in the offense uh, gain some additional range. And yeah, basically we're trying really to close them out generally on the outside, enticing them to attack us on our inside. Yeah. And, and you know, I think it's interesting too. Like um, this is, so I think I'll start with this. I think that Marazzo and Manchielino both agree with Vigiani um, and, and, there's, like Morazzo says, it's called Cota Longa Stretta, and that it's equally good for attacking as it is for parry. Mm -hmm. And um, that's a important kind of uh, point there in that he says it's equally good for parrying because, you know, we get this statement from Manchialino where he says that the low guards in particular um, are good for, uh, are primarily good for defending. And Morazzo agrees mm -hmm. with that. He says the same thing. 
he says that the, the, the low guards are best suited for defending. Um, but, you know, here, um, you know, Morazzo oftentimes give you a lot of different stuff, but um, he does he does kind of explain the, the nature of some of these guards, whereas, you know, Manchialino kind of goes into the, uh, the etymology of the term, um, says, do not embroil yourself with great masters, for they have a long tail, um, kind of giving us the mm-hmm. origin of this this terminology of uh, Cota Longa Strata. That is that they have the power to injure you by means of their numerous followers. Um, and I think there is a lot of creativity that kind of comes from Cota Longa Strata because there's so much you can do. Um, but I think that um, to kind of like come back to your point, uh, especially uh, with Cota Longa 2, not only is it like great because it has so much offensive variability, I think it also is great because... Um, Usually when you're attacking, because you have that hip forward position in Cota Longa Strata, when you go to attack somebody, you're generally going to go to a profile position. So you're going to send that right shoulder forward, which is the longest you are ever going to be reaching towards your opponent, right? Like that's that's a way to maximize your length. So if you can find yourself defending, as you often do in like Paladini or in a lot of the rapier sources, or even in Dalagokie, for example, where you're parrying in Seconda or Cordia de Entreri, as, as Dalagokie calls it, uh, which is kind of like becomes the bread and butter standard. Um, you see then like there, it's almost like you've got your hips turning towards your opponent when you make that Seconda parry or that Cordia de Entreri parry that you see in, in Dalagokie. And then you send the shoulder forward and that's when you can start to develop your your lunge behind it you engage your lap muscles your arm starts to come forward you know you kind of lean into your structure there um so there's there's kind of a a length uh, like a hidden length component that comes with it too so we can line the body up so it's cool yeah so i would i kind of think it's more offensive because i believe manchelino kind of explains bolognese philosophy is you throw an attack to induce your opponent to attack you to defend that opponent's attack, to hit them. And Cotolunga Strada is sort of a natural inviting position. First, as Martin says, you're staring with your chest open, with your heart facing your opponent, basically saying, come on, big boy, you got this, right? And then the ideal attack from there, uh, especially with the sword alone, is the Mandrido into Cingata Porta di Ferro Strata, or the wild pig, as I like to call it, um, which is the best position in which to receive an attack and completely ruin your opponent's day. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I think you get there going forward and backwards too. So mm-hmm. yeah. what were you going to yeah. say, Mark? Yeah, I really think that that play on the words with the big following in Kola Longa um, can also just mean that while the most natural attacks out of these uh, low guards, especially the Stretter guards, where the points already pointing forwards, is the thrust. Well, there are a lot of great follow-up actions after extending the thrust with uh, elongating the body basically and then turning around, throwing that mandrito either high, low or maybe even going to the other side. So there's a big, uh, like a lot of opportunities to attack around the opponent's blade if you got them already reacting. So there's a lot of what can follow up from that kind of action. I will also say that Kula Longa, especially Stretta, is especially nice against left-handers. Mm. Oh, yeah. Because it protects your, your sword hand quite well. Yeah, it protects your outside and lets you throw those mandritas to their sword hand. Or if they try to go around, let you throw the reverso to their sword hand. Yeah, that, that's that's fun. I like that a lot. Or Morazzo's favorite, which is attacking them with a falso impuntanto, like into their sword. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> which is fun. Um, so... Yeah, I think before we talk about the rest of the low guards, we should probably kind of emphasize too, um, and I think this speaks to to what Martin just said uh, specifically, is that like one of the things, and we'll talk about this more when we get to tactics, is that um, Manchialino says specifically that the low guards, the only natural attack is a thrust and Mm -hmm. a falso. Um, And and that has a lot to do with tempo, which again, we'll kind of talk about in a minute. But, um, you know, it is is interesting that... um, you know, we we are almost kind of like forced into kind of leading with thrust with these actions uh, versus allowing them to kind of follow up with cuts uh, as their primary action. Uh, but we see that in, explained in, in Vigiani as well. So we, we might touch on that a little bit as we're kind of going through some of these. I um, just want to sure. kind of put it out there so people are aware. Yeah. 
Yeah, there's definitely like a thought on the most direct action any guard can perform. And that is uh, especially present in Vijani as well, who says, well, out of any guard, you can basically throw any kind of attack, but there is some kind of attack that is more direct and therefore more dangerous because you have less time to react to it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so sometimes it's it's better to be prepared for the the one that's most dangerous and then, you know, kind of... Read, read and react to the things that might be less. So, um, so let's move on to Kotalunga Alta. Um, how about oh, this yeah. one, Martin? You want to take that away, Martin? Yeah, sure. So basically, in Dalagokia, like I said, it, uh, the Kotalunga kind of site is a bit strange because everything is on your outside, but especially the difference between Stead and Art is just for Dalagokia at least, which uh, foot is actually forward. So in Golalongestretta, the right foot's forward, and you're in that frontal position with the right foot maybe even a bit turned uh, towards your right side, so towards the outside, to get that nice frontal position. And in Golalonga Alta, well, you need don't need that diagonal foot, but because you have just your left uh, foot forward, so it's fairly easy to withdraw your dominant side a bit um, to make all of the same kind of actions, basically just from the other side forward. However, that uh, modifier alta can also just signify how high the hand is held. And that's especially, for example, present in Marozzo, who has his Gola Longa alta with the hands quite a bit higher. So while Stretta is uh, usually the hand close to the knee, maybe hip height, alta it's maybe sternum height. Yeah, how about you, Stephen? How about you, Stephen? Yeah. yeah. What does the yeah. other so, say? Because that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, the Anonimo basically has Kotalunga Stretta with the left foot forward. He has a Kotalunga Alta, but it's not a particularly important card. So I'm just going to go ahead and refer to the Anonimo's Kotalunga Stretta with the left foot forward because that's a useful and very important guard in the Anonimo. And again, um, so one of the, I think, the things that's great about Kotalunga Alta is it's, yeah, you guys tell me your experience with this as well, but it's the best guard to teach students right from the get-go. So a brand new person can usually form Kotalunga Alta right off the bat. It's hard to get somebody to stand in a strata because that involves a weird position for their body. And, you know, people are kind of lazy when it comes to for forming Porta di Ferro strata because it's uncomfortable to put your body into the necessary mm -hmm. profile. But if you give somebody a sword and you say, all right, put your left foot forward and have your chest face me, they will just sort of naturally drop into uh, Kotalunga Alta. Has that been your guys' experience as well? Yeah, for me, definitely. So like throwing anything towards your inside, there would be Porta di Ferro, of course, with the mm -hmm. with a right foot forward. But on the on the other side, yeah, from the outside, left foot forward is way easier because that's also the natural step that you would take while throwing a reverso, so a blow from an inside. side. Yeah, I, um, I think I've had relatively similar experience. It's easier. I usually cool. start at Sword and Buckler folks in, in Kotalunga Alta. Yeah, yeah, I think they, they, the sources seem to kind of agree on that. So for me, the most important thing about guards is not so much the position of the sword. So I really teach four guards because there's four basic body positions you get into in Bolognese swordsmanship. Kotalunga Alta is the other, the second of the body positions. Strata is you know, the first that we mentioned. Um, but one of the cool things about Kotalunga Alta is it's a convenient place from which to throw... Uh, reversos and thrusts and mandritos. You can kind of make each any of those blows fairly quickly and ergonomically from uh, Kotalunga Alta. Uh, you can make reversos in multiple ways, so preparing on the outside like a molinetto or bringing in, which is strangely the motion that uh, Morozzo refers to as a squalambrato. So I always thought that was a little bit of a weird bit there. Um, but yeah, I think Kotalunga Alta is a great guard. Uh, great guard to just start uh, teaching people with. Um, yeah, I mean, I could go wax on poetical about it, but it's fantastic. It's the third most used guard in the Anonimo Bolognese for a good reason. Yeah, I think it's uh, especially useful if you have a defensive offhand weapon, mm, so oh like yeah. a buckler or a shield, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. that kind of body position will just naturally bring your left shoulder, your left hand forward where you can then work with a nice big cone of defense, so especially right. uh, hiding behind your defensive implement, basically. Yeah. Oh, and also it has it's also useful for teaching beginners because the footwork out of there is almost always a passing step, and it's much easier to teach students to pass. 
than it is to teach them to step sideways with their front foot. Um, yeah, the downside is because it's left foot forward, it usually tends to be a little bit slower in execution. So uh, usually I, I find that when I'm fencing in Cotalunga Alta, it's as a result of either having given ground, like basically having passed back and ended up there, uh, or, you know, going forward and they're retreating. So what's your take on it, Joshua? Yeah, so um, I think that one of the beauties of Cotalunga Alta is that um, it has a sort of baked-in continuation mechanic. Um, uh, which is really interesting where, um, uh, you know, you're starting, I, I do mine a little more of a hips to the side. So I allow my hips to profile to the right when I'm in Cotalunga Alta mm -hmm. with my left foot mm -hmm. forward. Um, just so that way I have like more hip rotation going through when I go through mm -hmm. my progression. But when I get that first step in, let's say we're defending against a thrust, right? I might do something like a mesomandrito, like what we talked about in the last episode where I'm making that half cut down on top of my opponent's sword. So I might be doing a mesomandrito or a mesovolta with the hand to do the mesomandrito um, over top of my opponent's sword, right? And that puts me in a hip profile to the left position. Now I'm in, in Porta de Ferro Stretta, right? So I'm in a ready to go in my next position. And of course, from Porta de Ferro Strata, my most natural thing to do is to send either forward either a falso. So if my opponent withdraws off of like their thrust and comes around and attacks me with a reverso, then I can easily parry with a falso. Or if I if they stay with my sword over top of theirs, then I just allow my hips to then rotate forward by going up onto my back, mm -hmm. the toe of my back foot. And I yep. send a thrust forward in Gordia de Facie, like what we see in and Marazzo's defense against the thrust, and now I'm stabbing them in the face. Um, and so you've got these like really beautiful baked in body mechanics with something like Cota Longa Alta. Um, and it, it's an interesting guard in that um, it is something that we see uh, talked about as like a guard for, for everything that you can do. Uh, Marazzo says um, that this guard is useful uh, it's a useful guard in which to be patient. So it's a good guard to defend it. Mm -hmm. It's something that he prefers that you would defend it. And for this reason, you should tell your students that if they find themselves in some quarrel, that they must adopt this guard first when facing their enemy for their defense and make them understand um, what they can do therein, pro and contra. Um, so it, it's interesting that he says that that's kind of like, like if you're in a serious encounter, that's that's the guard that Marazzo wants you to hold. Um but then again, when we see him fighting with the uh, the sharp sword and the sword alone, um, that's that's mm -hmm. where he gives all of his thrust defenses, right? And and you can kind right. of see that as the beginning of whatever exchanges um, that might come out of that. So um, he, it's it's a guard that he definitely wants you to hold, and he he prioritizes. Um, and of course, um, Manchilino doesn't give us a lot uh, other than just kind of like talking about the posture. Um, he does say. You know, it does seem like there's a, a mechanic of the hand always kind of being a little more extended in Kotal and Alta, um, which is uh, is interesting. But, I mean, it could be uh, a consequence of the name also being Alta, Thai, uh, and, mm -hmm. and the sword yep. is kind of reaching forward. You have to, you kind of have to project the, the sword a little bit further forward, um, simply because if you do have your hips profiled off to the side versus profiled towards your opponent when you're in Kotal and Alta, um, you're going to have the limitation of your left shoulder is going to be forward, um, which can also be a nice provocation for your opponent because you're inviting them to attack you on that left shoulder um, and the sword is kind of recessed. But then you can easily step into your defense or step away if you have to mm -hmm. or step off to the side um, sure. and kind of get that cover. So Cool. I think we have done Kota Linga Alta. I think so. I think we did justice. So um, how about some... Uh, you want to do any talk a little bit of heavy metal you want to talk about ports of the ferro strata <laughs> <Heavy metal. laughs> it is the iron maiden guard <laughs> all heavy metal is just worse and worse variations of iron maiden <laughs> now that i completely disagree with so i made i made a really bad take on on medieval movies saying that dragon heart was the best in the last episode steven but i'm gonna i'm gonna criticize you for that one metallica is just iron maiden played not as well but fast <laughs> oh, God. you just you, you be careful man they've got a cult follower all right so yeah let's let's about talk about porta de ferro the iron gate um uh Martin, what do you think about Porta de Ferro Strata? Yeah, so um, basically it's one of the favorite guards of, I think, all of the Bolognese authors, and earlier and later certainly as well. 
For Vigiani, it's his fifth guard and it's still Stretta. It's defensive, so it's defensive and perfect. And really that turn of the body into the profile position, like just presenting the side of the body towards your opponent um, while having the sword on the inside, still close to the knee. So the hands fairly low, out of the way, uh, points forward. That presents such a little opening that is, this is such a great position to defend yourself in. And it's also not only a great starting position, but also a great position to get yourself in after you invited, for example, an attack to your inside while standing in Kula Longa. So usually here the fourth edge would be pointing towards your outside. So the right side as a right-hander. And even if they disengage, right? Even if they disengage, you have your sword hand fairly towards the middle then your following action, the mezzo with the hand that you described, so a little turn of the hand, that's a super quick motion if you stand in that profile position. And so it's it's really awesome to defend you on all sides. Mm -hmm. I agree. What about you, Steve? You yep, so um, so it's two, thing, two things I'd like to make about Porto de So I guess in the, our previous analogy, we talked about chess. And as I said, I kind of think of that iron gate Porta di Ferrostretta as the king's opening. It's your your most basic move because, as Martin pointed out, it's really the one that presents the smallest target to your opponent. If you form the guard correctly, I find most people uh, don't turn their chest away enough and uh, and do their shoulder because it is uncomfortable, and I, I probably don't as much as I should either. Um, so I always try to tell my students, if your enemy can see where your heart is located then you're not turned enough because that's the biggest problem most people have. They try to parry in Iron Gate and the opponent can do the, what you'd call false impotanto, where you just roll the hand up to engage that false edge and you can poke somebody right over their heart there. But if you have the correct profile, you actually can't. Um, so I think that's important. Also having the profile means when you move in the stringere technique, that is as I do it at least, where you're both engaged on the inside and you move laterally towards your opponent to gain the position of advantage, the more in line you are, the more strongly you will set their weapon aside. Um, yeah. So the downside, I think of it, it's not a very good invitation because you're moving into a position in which you look pretty darn covered. <laughs> it, it's not It's not very inviting. Yeah. You, you no. Have to... <laughs> but, I mean, we, we kind of see that a little bit. Doesn't, like, the Anonymous tell you to, like, cheat with your guard a little bit? Like, make it, make it like, enticing for your opponent um, in, the, in those, like, he goes through that, like, brief spell in, like, I think it's, like, maybe 7 through 13. I can't remember. It's been a while since I looked. But he, he, he kind of, like, get, he's, he talks about, like, kind of, like, letting it drift a little bit. Or, like, like kind of, like, letting it, keeping, keeping the guard open. Um to to create that provocation a little bit i think uh, he might say something about that but not not for all of them but just in in one specific play but um what what you uh what you, what you look that up steven i'm gonna i'm gonna go ahead and get my my take here on, on porta de ferro strata um so uh i love porta de ferro strata um i mean it's obviously uh it's Morato says um a Porta de Ferrostretta that sword would fall in Porta de Ferrostretta or Lagra, or moreover, um, he would have you to be patient if you were in that guard, um, and then to stay fixed in that guard, as it seems um, to me that no one who is in Porta de Ferrostretta or Lagra can do, cannot do many attacks, but I tell you truthfully that quite a lot of parries can be performed, namely falsi with Mandriti and Reversi, of such nature as seems best to you, um, or you can parry in Gorde de Faccia or in Gorde de Testa or in some other fashion, as I've taught you, which we'll talk about those guards in a little bit. Um, and then uh, Michelino says, this guard is called Porta de Ferrostretta by, vir being vir by the virtue of being safer than the others, um, and for its iron-like strength, unlike Porta de Ferro Larga, which you'll see next in the guard of the sword, and held tightly close to the opponent while keeping an equally tight defense of the right knee. So, um, I, what can I say about Porta de Ferrostretta? It was one of those guards where... I think, um, like, as a in sword alone, maybe because of uh, my early influence of both Morazzo and Dalagilke together, uh, I think that I, I kind of had this weird emphasis of, of chilling and, and Kotalunga Strata. Um, 
and it took me a while to like really like fall in love with Porta de Ferro Strada until I started really studying Manciolino like four or five years ago. And then now, I mean, it's my bread and butter. I, I you know, people, I, when they fence against me, they notice and they're like, wow, you're in Porta de Ferro a lot. And I'm like, yeah, come and attack me. <laughs> Please. <laughs> but yeah, so that's how I feel. I don't know. Cool. Yeah, especially with the, with the sword alone. Either two-handed or one-handed Porta de Ferro Strata is such a, such a great guard. And it's probably also why we see it so much in tournaments. Even if people don't know that they're doing Porta de Ferro Strata, they, they do. do some kind of version. Some, and, yeah, yeah, some version I, of it. And I agree with, with Steven that um, the most common mistakes with Porta de Ferro Strata is not turning the body enough. So Giovanni Della Gocchio would uh, describe that kind of thing as performing two parries, one with the blade, so hiding behind your blade on the one mm -hmm. side, but also turning the body away from the opponent as well. So especially right. if you're engaging the opponent on the inside, so for a right-hander that would be the left side, then you want to turn your left shoulder as far back as possible. And you need some good mobility in the hips to do that. Right. So you might want to stretch those adductors <laughs> and not fall into... yeah. That, so that's a pitfall uh, there when you don't turn enough that you're moving your hand too much to the inside, so to walk too much towards the left. And this is also something I see a lot when people perform that uh, parry in Guardi di Faccia, so that counter thrust, or in German would be absetzen, or anything like that, that they're pushing their hands so much to the left that they're leaving a huge opening on their outside. So if it works, it works, but <laughs> if not, you'll pretty much always get thrusted in the meantime as well if they do something. Yeah, um, it's it's pretty interesting. I it, I agree with that wholeheartedly, and I think you know, kind of one of the the body mechanics that I think is is really important about Porta de Ferro Strada in particular is that um, I think the Iron Gate almost is that hip chambering off to the side, you know, um, and and if you don't if you don't use your hips, like if you don't have your hips coiled and prepared for your next action, then you're kind of like losing what makes Porta de Ferro what it is like and, and what's really good about it um and the falso that comes from it that goes into Gordia de Faccia um like you said like the way that I think uh Manciolino uses it with the sword alone is brilliant in that he's basically almost kind of going to uh like in, in what you see in the KDF system where he's going to just control the center with his Gordia de Faccia you know with that falso that goes He's just controlling the center to kind of like make his opponent attack around the fact that he has now controlled the center, you know, and, and Steven has made a lot of chess analogies about um, kind of in, in a lot of these openings in chess, your your whole attempt is to just control the center. And I think that's exactly right. what it, what Porta de Ferro does is it's a passive way to control the center. Like you're, you're doing it from a defensive position, but that gives you initiative because Going into that falso and keeping that arm forward and well extended, like Morato or like Manchiolino suggests, um, with those hips now profiled and turning towards your opponent, allows you to really control the the center and, and force your opponent to kind of work around you, get bigger tempos because they're going to have to cut right, and you then can you can just do a small like quarter turn of the hand. It doesn't even have to be a half turn of the hand. You know, right. And then, and then the anonymous just like, yes, <laughs> uh, that's like <laughs> the beautiful fencing, right? That's exactly yep. what he wants you to do. He says that's the art. So cool. Yeah, and that's the third body position. So that's the right foot forward body and profile position. Yep. Maybe we should talk about the fourth body position now. The really the coolest of all the low guards. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, Chingiari Porta de Ferro Strada. Yeah, Pigs. the pig. <laughs> pig <laughs> take it Stephen. <laughs> all right i love this one so that's that's kind of our joke in our group that eventually we're going to make ourselves a battle flag with a pig when we made our little group emblem it's like a, a nasty looking pig um so the pig is awesome so the pig is basically a mirror of cotolunga strata so instead of your body being positioned to completely control the outside your body is now positioned to completely control the inside. Your right foot, or I'm sorry, your right shoulder points at your opponent along with your right foot pointing at your opponent while your left foot points off to the side. Um, and what's great about it is if your opponent is foolish enough to come to the inside of your sword, they, because of the positioning of your body, 
they they can't do anything there and you have the world's easiest passing step thrust kind of thing that you can do so inevitably they want to tarry on the outside line however for some reasons that I don't quite entirely understand, when you come out of Pig, you it's like you're being shot out of a t-shirt cannon. Like, you just have so much force with your body projecting kind of at that diagonal line from Pig that you will just push anything away from you. And so you can find your opponent's sword and... Um, crush through their guard this is one of the key parries in or key act early actions in the anonymo i think it's play 18 uh it's right around play 18 where you cut from kotalunga strata into the pig mm -hmm. and then they end up on your outside and they either attack you or they don't attack you and you just simply step at them and push their sword aside and poke them in the face and it's some serious bread and butter stuff there and and also the best, the two other great things about Pig, and then we'll move on because I really, I'm passionate about this guard here. Okay, Let is that, that passion it shine, looks, <laughs> it looks inviting. I mean, this is like it's so badass, and then it looks like you've made a tactical mistake. Mm -hmm. So it induces somebody to attack you when you where you want to be attacked. Unlike Strata, which doesn't really look like a mistake, Pig looks like a mistake, and that's just, oh, it's just beautiful. Um, and it works. In all the guard, in every Bolognese weapon combination that I'm aware of, with the possible exception of the glove fighting, you end up in pig at some point. It's pretty awesome in the two-handed sword. It's pretty awesome in the uh, sword and shield variations. The pig is just where it's at. Please, take it away, gentlemen. <laughs> yeah, it really is the might of the twist, right? The might of the twist combined <laughs> yeah, yep. with, a, yeah. with a profiled body position. Yeah. I'll say that in Jingar Portifero, it's even more important than in Kula Longa Strata that you probably need to turn your forward foot a bit towards the on the diagonal to oh, really yeah. get that twist going. So here it's even more important to really stand in that profile position, just like again in Portifero Strata, to not give that big opening towards your outside line. And if you describe it like that, then I get also the the anonymous description. Why it really matters, every inch matters here, because yep. if that outside opening is too big, well, then your Jingara Porti di Ferro Strata will just fail. It also looks quite enticing, I agree, because that right foot is trailing behind you, and it looks like an opening, but it's so far back, basically, that it's never a target uh, that right. is realistically struck. So especially... With that guard, you will parry almost anything towards your outside, either using the false edge or even with the reverse of the true edge, thrusting into Imbrakata or any other awesome follow-up action from there. So yeah, I really agree. It's it's fairly special towards the Bolognese, uh, Bolognese authors because left foot forward's not that commonly used, mm -hmm. uh, especially with the one-handed sword. So yeah, I think it's really special, and if you if you can use it well, well then uh, it's pretty awesome. Yeah. I think that's one thing that's really unique about um, uh, like the Bolognese tradition in general. I mean, it, it not uh, maybe it's just an Italian thing, but discordant body positions. Um, yeah. You know, <clears throat> I know that there are a lot of folks that I've talked to who have prior martial arts experience in like some Asian martial arts or Eastern martial arts. And um, one of the things that they've said is that really attracted them to the Bolognese system was the fact that it uh, its use of discordant body positions because that's something that they would see in like karate or in uh, like kukso or something like that, you know, and um, you don't really see a lot of those discordant body positions in something like KDF, um, at least from like the, the early KDF. Um, you start to see it a little bit more with Meyer, but we all know that he was mm -hmm. just a Bolognese author, you know, living yeah. north of yeah. the Alps. Giacomo so. de Basel. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we'll we'll give we'll give Meyer plenty of of flack here um, because this is a beginner episode and these these newer or these uh, foundations episode and the foundation of like moving forward with this material is to yeah. definitely like provide the heresy um, right and it, it's totally if you want to learn to fight in a formation the Germans were great at it but if you want to learn to fight as an individual the Italians were the masters of that that's, just, <laughs> that's how it goes yeah. yeah we definitely need to entice some kind of group feeling here <laughs> <laughs> I mean how many how many German fencing masters came down to Italy and took over I'm, I'm, I'm gonna say that number is zero that's true right and 
you know, they were so desperate for good fencing knowledge that they actually thought Fabris was good in in Germany. I mean, I guess you could argue that Fiore was uh, <laughs> was a German. I mean, he was Austrian, so. <laughs> I think wasn't he? He was uh, he's uh, that that ethnicity Fully. that's kind of like right there. He's actually yeah, Fully, yeah, Fully, yeah. Fully, Fully, yeah. or sort of like yeah, yeah. half I don't Slav, think half that Italian. He, yeah, he wouldn't have identified with any larger body. I no, think he, he was just yeah. a, a citizen of his town, basically, yeah. like any other Italian citizen. He would probably be a citizen would have of his kicked town. you in the balls for calling him a German too. Yeah, he would also <laughs> any Italian would probably have kicked you in the balls for calling them Italian. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah, to Chingiari. <coughs> um, but yeah, the Discord and body positions. Um, and this is one of those Discord and body positions. Um, totally agree with you, Martin. Um, that that profile of the front foot is is imperative or is uh, imperative um, in this guard. But again, um, you know, kind of talking about not only is the the body position discordant. Um, but it's also coiling. Um, so, you know, mm. before when I was talking about how you're kind of chambering certain positions, chambering certain actions, um, you're coiling your body. You're really kind of like preparing your body for your defense. And, you know, Ronzo is very explicit with this one in particular, um, that this is a defensive guard. Like, you're just right. going to defend from Chingiari Port to DeFaro. Um, he says that there are different attacks that can spring from this, namely... Um, falsos and uh, and thrusts and, and the like, um, but he he says that this is a position that you're going to take if you're defending yourself. Um, right. And we see that play out like through plays um, yeah. usually parry down into Chingyari Porta de Ferro. Right. Which, by the way, uh, I don't know if you guys have ever played with this, but like when an author like Manchiolino, for example, says to parry a thrust, and let's say you're in Cota Longa Alta and you're going to parry and you're going to go into Chingyari Porta de Ferro. No, other than just like getting that nice hip turn and really kind of like dropping the hips down, turning that mm-hmm. front foot and really like exaggerating to create Chingiari Porta de Ferro in that parry mm-hmm. just creates mm-hmm. so much body structure. Um, mm-hmm. And one of the things. It makes you look hella cool too. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because like, they're doing like, some big yeah. move and you're like, oh, come on, Ching- you made me turn my body. <laughs> <laughs> just, just die already. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I 100% agree with that, but I think another cool thing too, and and uh, I don't know if the Bolognese authors get enough credit for this, because I think this is a mechanic that we see a lot, is um, one of the downsides of your arms, um, the, the muscles, mus- musculature of your arms and your body structure, your body in general, um, uh, and your musculature is that um, you can extend forward, right? And you're going to have to mm-hmm. tense your muscles, right? Like these are, mm-hmm. uh, you have um, sort of... Your muscles will either contract. Uh, well, that's really all they do is they just contract, right? Um, so the directionality of your arm, once you've contracted your arm, you basically used your arm, right? Mm-hmm. In order to, to get it to go, it, yep. yeah, in order to get it to go again, you're going to have to rechamber. You're going to have to pull on another set of muscles, mm-hmm. which are going to rechamber it in a position where now it can go forward again, right? Mm-hmm. So one of the beautiful things about using your entire body when you're fencing. Um, and using your hips and, and using your foot position uh, and making some of these or just doing and doing this with a half turn of the hand, right, which your wrist muscles are a different set of group of muscles than, than your forearms and your, your uh, biceps and your, your back. So um, you've got just doing a, a slight half turn of the hand doesn't, doesn't use up your forearm and your, your biceps, which is what you're going to need to extend forward. Um, but then with your, your hips turning, now you're putting pressure down on top of your opponent's sword. You can make your parry basically without ever moving your arm, right? Right, and that's, that's the goal. Yeah, exactly. And, th- and that's the beauty of these positions, right? So when we talk about kind of like defending into these positions, what I was talking about before um, at, the, at the opening of this is like when you're making your parries, like if you parry into a guard and you're deliberate about right. parrying into a guard, but you're doing so by using your body position to go into those guards rather than like right. kind of just mm-hmm. parrying with the arm and kind of making what I call the oh shit parry, you know, which is where you're kind of like overreacting to your opponent's sword. Yep. By by reading what your opponent's doing and, and using your body to make the parry, you're actually preparing yourself or allowing yourself to be prepared for your secondary action, which now, now makes you faster, right? Because you don't have to do more actions to prepare that second action. I think that that's what it's really all about, yeah. So use yeah. your body for your first parry, and then 
if they're any good, they'll go to the other side, and then you can move your sword on that side, and you can make a parry counterattack combo. Yeah, and so that's where but I see, wanna, especially in, yeah, with like Ching Yari oh, to the Pharaoh yeah. and and Kotal right. Those are like those are like really coiled positions for me, right? Like yep. I think of those mm-hmm. as like you're really kind of coiling the body, you're preparing yourself, um, and right. we see that with like Morato's. Uh, depiction of Kotal on the strata where he really has the guy with his arm down and you kind of like really mm-hmm. see his body start to contort and like come off to the side and he's almost projecting that left shoulder forward mm-hmm. uh, which is it's kind of crazy right uh, in Kotal on the strata but that's kind of like that coiling action he's preparing the body for those attacks um, and so that way it's just more dynamic so should we move on to a different set of guards now um let's talk about uh port to def- we, let's, we can speed through these last three um so we've mm-hmm. got okay. um Porta de Ferro Larga. So, Larga? I'm not speeding through Porta de Ferro Larga, bro. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, why, don't you, why don't you take away? <laughs> All right. So, uh, to uh, I'm sure everybody here has seen uh, Return of the Jedi, or almost everybody here. So there's the classic, yeah. it's a trap line. Yeah. Well, that's, <laughs> that's Porta de Ferro Larga. It's the trap door. Okay. And, and it's, it's Porta de Ferro Strata, but... For some reason, you've just allowed the point to dip while your hand remains in the same place. And fun fact, essentially, it takes zero time to move your uh, the point of your sword to from a Larga to a Strata position. So Strata is clearly, it is an iron gate. It Like we discussed before, it's not a good invitation because it looks so secure. Porta di Ferro Larga is just disguised Porta di Ferro Strata. It is a. It is basically nothing but a finger squeeze to bring your point online. And generally speaking, I I like to think of a finger squeeze as something that takes basically no time in terms of fencing. Um, and by virtue of the sword beginning offline, you get so many more attacks. You can do so much more with Porte di Ferro Larga um, than you can with Porte di Ferro Strada. The there's various falsies you can make from there. It goes nicely in Guardi into Guardi di Testa. Uh, there's a lot of deception that you can do when your sword begins offline that's harder to do when your sword is online. Uh, I just straight love that. I, I probably spend as much time in Porte de Ferro Larga as I do in Porte de Ferro Strata, especially if I've got it. If I have a shield, I don't even bother with Porte de Ferro Strata. That's just pointless. <laughs> Steven, you're sounding like Vigiani, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, what do you think, Martin? Yeah, so um, just to give a little overview for our listeners, basically these three guards that we already had, Kodalonga, Porta di Ferro, and Cingiare Porta di Ferro, all have these little modifiers at the end. And Lager is just one of those modifiers. And some authors don't use them, but in general they are fairly logical in that any kind of guard that is Lager is held wide, so with the point towards the ground. Any guard with Stretter is with a point forward, so it's more for the c- uh, close play, for the constraint play. And with Alta, it's usually with the hand a bit higher, but still the points forward. Kulalonga, not so much, but uh, for Porte di Ferro and uh, also Chinga Porte di Ferro Stretter, that pretty much holds. And the only difference there is which foot standing forward. So in Porte di Ferro Lager, the right foot's again standing forward. It's super close to being Porta di Ferro Strata, just the Mandrito that you would have thrown to get into Porta di Ferro Strata would be thrown as a full blow. So you just pull it through towards uh, your left side, towards the ground, and so it presents a bigger opening. It's great to entice the opponent to attack, like Steven said, but it's more useful in white play. So especially if the point of the opponent is towards you and the measure is fairly close, well, then that guard might just get you killed. So um, be conservative about the kind, uh, the way you play with that guard, uh, the way you are you're going for these openings for enticing them to strike. But yeah, I, I think as well that's it's a really great guard, and I certainly use it a lot as well. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think it's interesting because Porta de Ferro Larga. We'll, we'll talk about this, um, I guess, in the in the the third episode that we do on this, which we'll we'll talk about tactics, right? Um, and uh, we'll talk about measure and, and interpretation. Like in interpretation, Porta de Ferro Largo a lot of times is a trigger for, um, for understanding things um, because it usually means that your cut is full um, 
or that you've like allowed your cup to go full, which usually means your opponent is retreating. But we'll get back to that in a minute. Um, but yeah, Ports of Deferral Larga, I agree with you, Stephen. It is, I mean, it's a trap, right? Like, I mean, <laughs> in, in the KDF tradition, they call it the Fool's Guard or the or Alber. Um, you know, it's um, because, you know, you're, you're trying to fool somebody or perhaps uh, they're a fool for attacking you if you're right. in the guard. Or maybe it's because the fool knows all, because the fool sits beside the king. Who knows? Um, Who knows? Yeah. But it, the, it, in all, um, you know, Porta de Ferro Larga, um, it is one of those guards uh, that just, it, it adds a little bit more of a body dynamic in that um, it has all of the defensive capabilities of Porta de Ferro Strata. Of course, it does have a tiny bit of a measure component to it where you have to be aware of. So you have a little bit of a bigger tempo. Um, but it also adds a little bit more offensive capability because you have a lot of cuts that you can do from Porta de Ferro Larga. Um, there are a lot of reversos that you can throw. Where you basically turn the sword back into like a Soto mm-hmm. Brachio, um, mm-hmm. which we're going to talk about here in just a second. So it's a nice transition, but you're going to turn the sword back into Soto Brachio in order to give a reverso that goes under arm or something like that. Like something that we probably see a little bit more with uh, with um, the uh, sword buckler material uh, but i think the anonimo does it a fair amount um, especially when he's fighting left-handers he likes to cut into soto and sopa Brachio. like he's like attacking their hand and he'll let the sword kind of like chamber back so he can come back with these big cuts but um yeah so i i think it's it's kind of fun that you know porta de ferro larga it's it's we see it in dalagokie um used as a trap like he he kind of gives you that the whole expression of that trap door where you're kind of rising back up with that fall so driving a thrust you know to to mm-hmm. sort of again dominate that center line and just kind of force your opponent to attack around and then you know he gives a nice tight counter attack where you're just turning up into um yeah. what the anonymo would call a gordita and to, to parry so i guess it is a lot like stuff. chess it's, it's all about dominating the center you can try to dominate the center from mm-hmm. the get-go or you can try to allow your opponent to come into the center and then you build your defense around the idea that they're going to the center and you're setting them aside yeah, yeah. And it, it's risky not to play the center, right? Like, I mean, mm-hmm. you know, it's uh, sometimes sometimes you think that you just want to kind of like get that counterplay. So you try to play around the flanks and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And you realize that you've made a colossal mistake and that you should have just mm-hmm. confide for and the center. And then they stab you. Yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah. Uh, I guess the only difference between this and chess is you can always reset and, and retreat. <laughs> right. Um, but you don't want to because we're Italians, right? So don't, right. I mean, don't actually because then you're going to lose your shame. Uh, and then you won't shame. also learn your game. The whole, the whole learning of the game is to learn to not give ground. Yeah. Um. So let's talk about Soto Brachio real quick. So what is this? Soto Han Solo? Huh? What's going on here? What is that, Martin? What's, what's uh, Soto Brachio? Yeah, so it just means under the arm. And basically it refers to your offhand. So basically now your sword is under your non-dominant side. So in Angelo Vigiani, that would be his first guard, actually, where he just draws his sword from the scabbard. So basically the points uh, towards the backside, the hand is low and on the left hip, basically. And from there we can, for example, throw rising reversi or to be honest, any kind of blows, but some kinds are more direct than others. But yeah, basically it's also like a nice invitational guard. It's used heavily with uh, defensive implements, not so much with the sword alone, though. Yeah, like not used with the sword alone. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, yeah. it's big in sword and small buckler. So uh, Soto Braccio is just the same for all you I-133 or I-33 folks out there. It's the first ward. It's yeah. the sword is in your armpit. Um, really nice for the sword and small buckler so if you're doing sword and small buckler and you're cutting against you you want to attack somebody who's taller than you you want to cut into soto braccio because you can clear through the leg space they might try to use for a counter attack and then step back in and throw a nice big reverso uh, i think that's Morozo's fifth play of his uh, first assault so really useful for in my opinion for shorter fencers for the sword and small buckler um also, it's useful for getting into uh, Metzaspada with a false edge. So that's Manchelino's first, uh, in the first assault, where he gives his first demonstration of how to enter into the Stretta, where you would cut into uh, Soto Bracho on a step, on a cut and step back, and then you enter back in with a big, powerful falso into Guardi de Facha. So you're now dominating the center with your false edge. 
and then it's from there there's a bunch of actions you can do he prefers with the more natural one which is just to pass left with a thrust and that that kind of opens up the game there mm -hmm. so i found it's pretty much only useful with the sword and small buckler mm -hmm. i think yeah i i'd see it with a, a variety of weapons um i think it can be used with pretty much anything in, in the left hand as long as you can defend yourself right as long as you can kind of like keep mm -hmm. something forward um, just because it creates a lot of kind of sneaky attacks you know you can basically hide your intention um and, and manchilino i think plays with that a lot with sword and small buckler where you know you're kind of like you're kind of playing this game where like imagine even if you had something like sword and cape you know you don't know if it's going to come forward with a thrust or a cut um, right could be right. either um, so uh, yeah but yeah it's um just that just under the arm um it can go kind of point off to like at an angle um i think you can point kind of straight back i i don't i think usually more at an angle like almost like you're kind of like creating an obtuse angle with your hand um is more natural uh, but i don't think it's ever really described in anything other than just that the sword goes under your arm and of course it is uh because it's a wide guard um it's not a defensive guard uh it's a offensive guard right so mm -hmm. um that's that's something to kind of emphasize here a little bit um is that it is uh, its primary motive is, is offense. Um, all right, so let's start talking about high guard. So um, we've kind of gotten one of our, we've gotten two of our wide guards, right? Which it means that we're kind of like, now we're going to get into the rest of our high guards, which for the most part are going to be kind of like wide-ish in a way. But, you know, mm -hmm. one of the things that Manchialino says, um, he says that the low guards are, are better for defending and for giving thrusts and that the thrusts are the more, more natural attack. He says of the high guards that their their natural thing is to attack. So right. um, let's get a little offensive here. Um, so Gordia Alta, uh, what is this one good for? Mark. Yeah, basically the name just says that it's your standard high guard, uh, usually depicted with the sword hand stretched out high above you, points even a bit towards your backside. Either foot can be forward, and here, especially with the high guard, uh, Dalogakia mentions, and I th think Manchalino does this as well, that it's not really important which foot is forward, but uh, just the hand position is determining the actual guard and the, the function of that guard. And basically, if you uh, expect to throw any kind of fendente, then Guardia Alta is the way to go. But of course, with some bigger motions like that big windmill motion behind you, you could also throw the montanta like we uh, explained in the last episode. All right, yeah, so the by virtue of our body positioning and our hand positioning there, we have a crazy number of attacks. So if you could imagine there's eight, there's basically eight attack angles. Um, and uh, we have it attested through the various sources that you can throw a fendente so you can throw straight down you can throw a mandrito squalombrato you can throw a mandrito tondo you can throw a rising mandrito you can throw a rising false edge cut that's a montante you can throw a rising reverso from guardia alta that's both in the anonimo and in manchalino and according to the anonimo you can also throw a reverso tondo so of the eight possible cutting angles that you can make uh, with a sword, you can do seven of them from Guardi Alta. So yeah, that's you. It, it's highly adaptable for cutting. Um, two interesting things is the question of leg and foot positioning. I guess we could probably get into that more when we talk about footwork. So really, uh, get into that position is interesting to do with your feet together because that also creates uh, a lot more. Uh, opportunities for stepping also from guardia alta you can make an imbrocata that is a descending thrust as well so there's two thrusts that i can think of that are directly attested that is the descending thrust and then there's the just unfair like just it's just cheating which is the rising thrust thrown as a montante so you're really you're literally windmilling and then as if that's not difficult enough to deal with you turn that up into a thrust to your opponent's face it's uh, it's really fun, especially with the sword and small buckler, um, because the defensive armament does not get in the way of your sword, and so you can just do all sorts of fun stuff from Guardia, Guardia Alta. What do you have to say about this one, Joshua? Yeah, Guardia Alta, you know, obviously good for offense. It's something that we also really only see with um, some sort of a defensive implement. Um, you know,
know, it's it's something that we don't see a lot with the sword alone. Um, I think there are a few instances in the in the Anonimo, in the Anonimo yeah. where he yeah, does. Yeah, but he knows how to Alta. fence, so it makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> oh god! Yeah. Um, interesting note here. Um, so with Alta, um, so. Uh, Martin was describing the posture and he was describing how the, the sword is kind of pointing behind you. Um, and that's actually really important because um, uh, Vigiani speaks to this is when the sword is off, when the point is offline is in it's pointing, um, especially behind the only natural attack uh, we before, like we were talking with the low guards that the only natural attack is a thrust. When the point is pointing away from uh, that person or behind them is not pointed towards you. The only natural attack that that person can give is a cut, right? So mm -hmm. in order to, because in order to give you a thrust, they have to make a turn of the hand, a mezzavolta, which is a tempo, which you can read. And therefore they have to give you sort of a Dewey Tempe action. So they would have to turn their hand and then drive the thrust. Um, in order to, to let that thrust come through. Now, there are some kind of tricky things that you could do. You can make it look like you're going to throw a montante and then, you know, throw a thrust, right? Something like that. But again, you're already kind of like understanding from Gordialta that you're giving this really big tempo, this big action. Um, but in general, um, especially with like Soto Brachio, for example, like with Soto Brachio, the natural thing is only going to be a cut. So point on line guards, the natural thing is a Generally, it could do either a thrust or a cut, and point off line guards or point when the point is pointing away from you is and the natural attack is a cut. So that's kind of a quick thing that you can kind of like bake into your psyche of mm -hmm. understanding. Like yep. when you're looking at somebody, that's one of the first things you really want to look for is is that point pointed towards you or is it pointed away? Right. That's kind of one of the first things mm -hmm. that I kind of think of. Um, and so Gordy Alta, of course, like it has incredible attacking potential, and it is just an attacking guard. When somebody holds Gordia Alta, they are saying, I'm going to be aggressive here. Like I'm going to attack <laughs> you. You know, yeah. they're not they're not saying, Hey, I'm coming in to defend. They're saying, I'm coming in to get you. Um so it, it is definitely a statement guard. And we see it so much through, you know, uh the Bolognese small and sword and small buckler material, but you're kind of developing that aggressive um, you know, ideology there. Even though there you're a, a, a nymph you're supposed to be beautiful and lithe. Um, <laughs> you are showing a tremendous amount of aggression uh, because of, of the cards that you're holding. So it's, it's actually super interesting. Okay. Um, so Gordia de Alicorno or Leon Corno or Unicorn, the beak bro. guards. Just, just to make it simple. It's <laughs> Unicorns, yeah, lions, and beaks, <laughs> rar. <laughs> what are we going for here? Uh, Martin, take it away. Yeah, so... For Angelo Vigiani, that would be his second guard, his Guardia Alta Offensiva Perfetta. So the perfect offensive guard, which naturally just is the most natural uh, beginning point to throw an Imbarcata, so a thrust from above. Well, depending on the author, like I said, it's uh, called differently. So Guardia Alicorno would be in uh, Dalagoc here. In um, Rozzo, he distinguishes which foot is forward, so depending on that, calling it Becca, Posa, or Cesa. Um, but yeah, it's basically first and foremost an offensive guard that threatens that kind of thrust from above. It's also uh, usually a frontal position, so again, chest facing forwards, or maybe even a bit more uh, like the left shoulder is almost facing forwards. Um, in Dalagokje, usually and with Vijani especially as well the right foot standing forward so we are threatening that that lunging kind of motion as well but yeah it's it's really like an inviting position on the one hand for uh, for the opponent to to strike you in but on in the same time like we said for the Imbocata it, it threatens that really dangerous thrust that it's um that is fairly mortal on the one hand and it's also really hard to parry yeah steep Okay, well, I'm, I'm going to expound at a little bit of length at this because uh, I'm also passionate about the Unicorn Guard. Uh, but let's we'll, we'll go back to our, our other show first. So uh -huh. Guido Rangoni, our, our hero of Morozzo, is famous for his preference for the for Porte di Ferrostretta. His opponent, the big, strapping, powerful Hugo Popoli, favors Guardia di Liancorno, the Unicorn Guard. Okay, and so this is, first and foremost, a tall dude's guard. You can see short people try and do this, but it generally depends. Everything about this guard comes down to somebody being over you, 
so that their point is coming down at you. Um, and it allows them to both find you with the false edge and draw, drill a thrust through your pathetic attempts at parrying. Or if you don't have your sword in presence, they can drill a thrust right directly into your hand. So most defenses that actually work against Guardia di Leoncorno, against the Unicorn Guard, is you're simply trying to reset to a neutral position. It's that OP. It's that overpowered. Uh, OP is my kid's um, slang <laughs> for overpowered. Sorry about that. Um, so in the chess equivalent, uh, Unicorn Guard would be essentially be trying to just swipe all of your opponent's pieces off of the board with your hand. It's all about overpower <laughs> body mechanics. Um, most people can't defend against Unicorn card, so that is its big downside. And one of the things I'm hoping we can get in this, most people will just simply give ground to Unicorn Guard because it's, like I said, it's that overpowered. And this is the disgusting part about Unicorn Guard. It's overpowered on the inside and the outside. If opponent tries to defend on the outside, it's pretty, you have a mechanical advantage when you're drilling down with your weapon unless they really have their body positioning down. You can push their weapon down on the outside, but if they're on the inside, you can find them with your false edge and push them down on the inside too. It's just, it's kind of cheating. It's kind of cheating, and it's also why it's kind of a lot of people's favorite guard, including Angelo Vigiani. He, he built an entire system out of just using this, which tells you he was not a short guy, probably. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah um, to build on that chess analogy, I guess you could say like the uh, Porta de Ferro Strato would be like the Gioco Piano, right? Like it's the, the right, Italian sure. game. It's nice and slow. Yeah. Right, because right. you're defensive, and this one would probably be like the London system, where it's just like you're just trying to get everybody to trade down in the center to just right. open everything up, so that way <laughs> just it's just it nothing but development. Right, and you're just getting all yeah. your pieces out, and it's just it turns into like an attacking chaos. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, this is like you know, if you fight somebody who's in in Porta de Ferro Strada, um, eventually you're going to have to try to get them to commit to getting out of their guard. Right, like I mean. Right. And there's no better way to do that than to say, you know what, I'm going to assume, uh, you know, Gordi de Alicorno, and I'm going to just rain Impercatas down on your Porto de Ferro right. until right. you leave, in which case I'm going to start just, you know, kind of doing terrible things to you. Um, you know, it, it's one of those things where, um, you know, sometimes... Sometimes you just got to, you got to give offense and, and the best, the best means of offense, like, um, like what Vigiani kind of explains. And the reason why he calls it the, uh, offense of perfetta is because it can give both thrusts and cuts equally without much disregard between the two. So, um, you can be really deceptive in what you're going to give. You can even make a, something start to look like a thrust and then turn it into a cut by just kind of like giving a half turn of the hand. So there's a lot of like crazy mechanics that you can do to kind of unsettle your opponent in their defense. Um, and it just has a tremendous amount of attacking potential. Um, I agree with you um, there, Martin, in that uh, I think it is usually a like a hip forward guard. Um, I usually allow my feet to kind of narrow a little bit um, when I'm in the guard. So I'll, I'll bring my front foot kind of in, just like I would with Gordia Alta. I think a lot of the high guards, I allow my posture to kind of go a little bit more upright. But then again, I'm, I'm also projecting this kind of attacking potential to my opponent. I want them to think, especially as a taller person who's 6'3", I want somebody to think that I look like just a tower of death, you know? And right. so um, when I when I assume um, Gordia de Alicorno, you know, like making myself even taller, I think just just really kind of like demoralizes people because I usually fence small when I'm in low guards. Like I'll allow my hips to really sink down. I, right. I kind of fight with yeah. a very low base to chamber my legs. Um, I know that's kind of difficult for a lot of people, um, but I do think it's something that people should pursue as a stretch goal because I think it does allow you to have more power, especially as you're rising uh, into your actions. But I do the opposite when I'm in high guards. Um, I, I project myself tall and I will allow my, my chest to become very straight. My back is straight. I'm, I'm very erect in my posture and really kind of projecting myself. Um, but yeah. I mean, there's, there's just so much you can do from that guard. We could do a um, whole episode on just unicorn yeah. guard. Yeah, and, and you know, yeah. it's it's criminally underused in the, in the rapier sources. Like, I mean, they talk about it, right? I mean, it's Prima. Uh, it's it's the first guard. Um, it's, uh, 
just to kind of mention this, it's the first guard that you would hold. A lot of times it is uh, because it is the position that you would end up in if you, when you're drawing your sword from your scabbard. Um, but, you know, in the Polynesia system, it's like everybody's just like, hey, this is actually a pretty cool guard. Mm-hmm. Let's use this. And then for some reason, the rapier guys are just like, bro, I'm just going to use second and fourth and third sometimes. It's weird. Yeah, they usually reason that it's uh, quite tiresome. And to a certain degree, They're lazy. <laughs> yeah, I agree. If, if, if the game becomes even more narrow, like uh, Giovanni de la Gogh here describes this in his work, that, like I said last time as well, that the fencing of the Asian ancient was more white, more beautiful, and fencing by his time, so the uh, 1570s, became much more narrow. The points presented more towards uh, the fort, and as um, the hilts developed, so did the hand as well. So it's mm. not like the the hand is ha- held high over you with a point forward, but the hand is um, pointing forward as well. Then it gets really tiresome on, on the shoulder mus- muscles. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I can see where they're coming from. But uh, certainly after every kind of reverso parry, uh, it's it's still a great guard to get in. Like it is, yeah. We see it in Giovanni de la Gocchio as his main play he would uh, teach someone who was in need to learn to fence within 30 days it's a main play of uh, angelo vigiani we see it in fiore we see it in vadi so it's all over the place that kind of guard yeah yeah it is it's kind of like this um, universal action um, for both defending yourself well and for um, kind of providing a really great offense so yeah. you could say it's kind of the, the jack of all trades there Yeah, I guess, you know, as fencing changed from being for, you know, military people to being for, you know, tailors and students, they needed something that was going to be less tiresome on their body because they weren't used to conditioning it like somebody who was, you know, training to do physical combat, essentially. So they needed to, that's probably why they would prefer something that was more comfortable. That could Mm. have been changing. Yeah, that makes sense. And really, that guard is also great to just thrust around defensive implements. If we oh, yeah. if we imagine a battlefield with with shields and mm-hmm. uh, helmets and stuff, there is always like some kind of weak point in the armor right at the neck that you could mm-hmm. get in if you thrust behind the shield. Yep. Like if you uh, just imagine the the ancient Greek vases with uh, the hoplites with their mm-hmm. with their shields and the spears in the overhand position. Well, that's basically Guardia del Corno or. Becca Chessa, Posa, yeah. how, name it. Whatever you want to call it, yeah. Marazzo needs to go change his pants. <laughs> <laughs> he just brought hot plates into discussion on the uh, Cordia de <laughs> He'd be pretty excited about that. Um, <clears throat> okay, so this is going to probably get a little controversial here. We're going to talk about Cordia de Testa. So viewer discretion is advised. This one seems a little heady. <laughs> Gordy to test that. Uh, I feel like I have the most controversial view on that. Um, so, so I'll start with the with the basics first. Uh, so, in in Marozzo we have a fairly nice picture of that kind of guard, and it's shown with the hand held on the outside, the points are high and a bit towards your left, so it covers the outside. Um, hand is also sh- around shoulder height, maybe a bit lower, and well, it's usually meant to to cover the head and then follow up with with another action. For example, a dritto tramazzone, so some type some type of cutting around action, either behind the opponent's sword or just to the other side. In Dalagokio, we are getting the description that is actually just the point towards the left and towards the ground the hand towards the opponent so it's the hand is held a bit higher maybe head height and it covers actually the other side so the inside um against for example if the opponent throws a mandrito so something towards your left side you would raise your hand basically let the sword uh, point drop and cover there and from there you can also like um, throw dritti tramazzoni or do some kind of other action for example go back up there with the with the reverso I would, so, and that's the basics. Um, Now the controversial view is that actually it's both in all the authors. So, for example, in uh, Giovanni della Gocchia, especially with with the sword and dagger, we are sometimes told to parry an incoming mandrito, so something against our left side, 
with the dagger held in Guardia di Testa. And that kind of position doesn't make really a lot of sense if we let the dagger point drop towards our inside for the left hand, so that would be towards our right. It's way better if the point's standing up. On the other hand, in uh, Marozzo, we get a couple of hints, at least, in the uh, close play. So the uh, stretter, the half-sword plays with the uh, sword and buckler, where he tells you a nice disarm, where you are basically letting your point drop. So you're parrying an incoming mandrito as well, so the opponent strikes towards your left. You let your sword point drop, lift the hand high, and then you're grabbing with your left hand underneath your own sword and you're grabbing the opponent's arm or their sword or whatever. And then you go on from there. And at a later point, I think he calls that, um, he refers to that position again and calls that Guardi di Testa as well. So I'll certainly, we can link that in the show notes so you can uh, get your own picture. But yeah, I think it's, uh, it's fairly variable. Steven? Okay, well, in the sources that matter to me, so that's the non dalagokia ones, it seems generally pretty clear to me that it's point up. So this is what I like to do to teach Guardia di Testa uh, to a student is I don't teach them. I say, I'm going to hit you in the head with a downward cut as hard as I can make it. If you get hit in the head, and I don't let them wear a mask when they're doing it because um, I have found there's a an operating system that's actually built into all of us, at least all of boys I, I don't have a lot of female students so i'm not 100 percent sure and i i don't really have the guts to just wail at a chick um i say okay you're not wearing a mask i'm going to hit you as hard as i can in the top of the head don't let me hit you and 99 out of 100 students form a very nice guardia di testa with the tip kind of pointing up into the side so that the blow comes right down into their guard it's it's baked into our dna that when something is raining down at our head, we will put our thing there with our body actually structured more or less properly to not get cleaved in the head, which I think is I think uh, it's awesome. Um, so I like to think of Guardia di Testa less as a static position, where it's generally not used as a static position, uh, except in Sword and Small Buckler in the Anonimo. Um, and there's like one play or something like that. It's primarily a circular parry. Um, made in, at least with the use of the, uh, in sword alone, it's going to be a circular parry. So that's going to be, if somebody is dominating to your inside, you can cover anything with a sweeping parry um, that just closes all of your lines, essentially. Yeah, and you're, uh, you're talking, uh, just so I can illustrate for people here, yeah. you're, what he's illustrating with his hand is in circular, as in, like, it's coming from low to high, so it's it's like kind of like turning into position, um, almost like he's making, drawing a, like a backward C shape. Yeah, thanks, yeah, like a, yeah, like a C, yeah, exactly, yeah. or, yeah, backward C, yeah. Or, yeah, so, or drawing the C upside down, like, drawing yeah, a C from upside the bottom down or something, yeah. yeah. So, um, but yeah. You, you can sweep, <laughs> um all of your lines essentially in that one motion and it's very useful when you're in a situation essentially where you can't do the normal parry which is where you put the true edge on and then you poke them right so that's kind of how i teach it um, and how i find that it's most used and the thing that's great about it is the number of attacks you can make from that position while controlling the opponent's weapon so you can imbrocata you can throw uh with we would call a grazing mandrito i think what they call a winding cut in german where you basically just turn the weapon and it will ride down their weak and you will basically slice them in the face while controlling their weapon or if they're strong you can then just if they're sorry if they push off hard you can just cut around um so when i have students it's also very natural for students to want to parry in the tip down position because the offenses afterwards are very nice um, I'll usually invite them to do that, and then when they do that, I just change the angle of the cut slightly to hit their hand. And usually, most people, after being struck nice nice and firm on the hand once, kind of like to change their game. Um, a lot of it comes down to the protection that we have, uh, which protects our heads much better than it protects our hands. Um, so I've never been a big fan of the tip-down Guardi Detesta because I really like my hands, and I don't like getting hit on my hands. 
Um, there are instances of the tip down parry being used in the Anonymo, in the, the good source. Um, and that is where we have lost so control to our, uh, our outside and we are yielding around the weapon. And so if you can imagine, they have control of our weapon and then we can allow our hand to go up because they can't actually make an effective strike against our weapon because we're engaged. And then you make the tightest little circle you can to protect your beautiful hand as you back out into the pig. And then if you're lucky, they'll continue to follow up. And, and then that's when you get to hit them. Um, so not a big fan of tip down Guardi de Testa. I think it's, well, I won't, I won't speculate on that. Joshua, why don't you tell us your take, your hot take on the guard yeah, of the head? So, um... I, I used to believe uh, in a transitory Gordia de Testa. Um, I had argued uh, pretty vehemently for that for a long time um, until I just couldn't justify it anymore. Um, and that's really when I, I focused, started focusing my studies primarily on, on Manchiolino and Murato uh, specifically. And now I, I'm a believer in, in the sort of Gordia de Testa is at shoulder height um, and the point is up and slightly slightly to the left, but um, there are some some body mechanic issues that I think that are, are really important to that, and I'm, I want to get into those in a second. But to, to just kind of justify my my reasoning for Cordia de Testa, um, I think the reason why we see a shift in in Cordia de Testa and Dalagoke in particular um, with the sword. Um, maybe not with the dagger necessarily, uh, because most of the time daggers don't necessarily have a full complex hilt. Um, we still see less less um, hand protection on a, on a dagger. So I think it makes more sense for the dagger to kind of replicate what we saw with side swords, especially early versions of side swords with less hand protection. Whereas swords by the time of Dalagoke in 1572 had actually become a little bit more complex. And so it's like almost like a, a saber parry makes more sense because you've got hand protection built into your weapon. And same thing with a more complex a hilted side sword uh, or sword in general. Um, that you might have seen in, in 1572 with Dalagoke, where when you have more hand protection, you can expose those knuckles and you can kind of push them towards your opponent. Um, and, um, you know, I, I do think that in, in a lot of ways, um, and this might speak to what you were talking about with the um, the, the Strata play uh, there, Martin, with uh, with wrestling a lot of times, you might start a parry and coordinate and test and your opponent might try to force your sword down. And anytime they're trying to force from the outside, you know, if anybody's done any wrestling, you know that, going weak into your opponent's strength a lot of times can give you then a strong position, mm. which then sets up that grappling position. Um, Cause I do think that's something we see a lot. Um, and so um, I kind of see that as like a, a, a progression progression of wrestling where you can kind of like take that position. I think you even do that uh, in my opinion, in my interpretation of, of Manchialino's two swords um, with his, his parry, um, his first defense that he gives um, where he's pairing. I think he's kind of got this, like you're starting in Gordia de Testa and then you're kind of rotating it across as you're going for that or that, that thrust underneath. Um, to the body mechanics though, uh, with Gordia de Testa in particular, I think a few things to kind of emphasize here um, that I see with Gordia de Testa is when I go into Gordia de Testa, one of the things that Manchiolino says is to always make your defenses going forward and with your arms well extended. Um, all of the authors generally agree that this is about at shoulder height. I think that lower can be beneficial, and I agree I agree with that, um, but not to go above the shoulder. Um, when you start to go above the shoulder, your structure becomes weak. Mm -hmm. So anytime yep. that hand drifts above the shoulder, uh, you lose structure. Whereas if you keep the, the arm at shoulder height, um, then you will, you'll maintain structure. So anything kind of like dropping down, but there's you're aligning your muscles in a way when you are at shoulder height that you have a lot of strength. Um, another thing that I like to think of with Gordia de Testa in particular is I always keep my forward knuckles. So my, I guess that's my second knuckle right there. Like, with, like that. Um, and my thumb kind of pointed towards my opponent when I'm parrying in Gordia de Testa. So um, I do that because that's a strong angle. So um, for those listening at home, if you were to take your arm and you are to line your arm up so that way like you're pointing with your thumb and you lay your thumb down on top of your fingers. If you were to have a straight line from the tip of your thumb all the way down your arm, um, that's that's good structure. That's your strongest structure that you can have. And you can hold Gordia de Testa in that position going forward. Um, and then the second thing that I'd like to like kind of emphasize with the body mechanics of Gordia de Testa to really kind of give a strong parry um, is it's a hip forward position. 
So a lot of times we see this as a transition um, going from like Porta de Ferro Strata or something like that. And so you're, you're engaging with those hips kind of coming forward. You've got your arms straight, straight out like that. And you're basically taking everything off to um, your outside of your right arm. Um, when you're when you're giving that parry, and that's a lot of times where we see it's got that snappy uh, mandrito that's coming back down, um, or something like that, and a lot of times we see it kind of like coming underneath an attack, like from behind, and it's like you're forcing the momentum of your opponent's right. attack to continue in the direction that it was going, right. and you're just you're kind of like playing behind that, and that could be the geometry aspect of this. Um, so one thing I wanted to add to the the discussion is Dalagoke does use a tip up guardia di testa, I believe. I think he just calls it reverso. Yeah, certainly. So um, okay. yeah, especially against the reverso tondo, he says to just parry it with the true edge, for example, or to yes. parry it with the reverso scolimbro. Um, but certainly against a, like a normal kind of version, he also uses guardia di testa. And I think he also has that kind of mindset of parrying towards the outside because more often than not. He follows up that Guardi di Testa parry, even if it's a Mandrito that strikes you, with an Imbrocata. So he tries right. to really get that blow into the forte, so the strong part of the of your blade, push right. it a bit towards your outside and then get your thrust back in. And basically back. just, if it's too horizontal or too low or anything like that, or they're just too strong, then you go around and you let the sword glide towards your debole, so the weak part of the blade right. towards the tip. And strike around your Driti Tramazzini or right. any kind, uh, kind of like that. So I really think uh, he he does think that Guardia di Testa is that kind of horizontal or even a bit with, with the tip up high if it comes straight downwards or if it comes more towards your left, where you let your point drop to close that angle. He says that specifically, and I think on the other side he uses. He doesn't use the name Guardi di Testa there anymore, so he right. definitely has not that like outside parry that we see depicted in Marozzo anymore. But he uses that kind of action, right? He right. just doesn't use Guardi di Testa. He just names the action: use your true edge, use your use true use, edge, or make yeah. a reverso. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, which is really kind of a shame because uh, if he just used it, that name one time, <laughs> that would be really clear. <laughs> what would we have to argue about, man? Yeah. Guardi di Testa by any other name is just as sweet. Would be really boring. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> if you just didn't use it one time. Exactly. So yeah, and and like Manchilino does describe the mechanic of using the sword like a wheel, like Dalagokie does. Um, he does it with the the sword and cape, where he says to like let the hand kind of turn mm -hmm. with the point down, like it's a mm -hmm. wheel, in order to then cut a fendente. But then the very next play, he says use Gorde de Testa, and I always kind of use that as like okay, like man, here's Manchilino. If that was Morato, whatever. Right, like <laughs> Murato would do something stupid like that, where he describes an action in one play, and then the next play tells you to do a named action, right? But that's not really Manchialino's mo, um, so I don't really see him as seeing that as like as Gordia de Testa. Um, but I do think that there's a an interesting tactical component. We'll, we'll expand on this more when we get into episode three, but I do want to highlight it real quick. Um, and this is interesting about Dalagokie. Um, and as you were describing this, Martin, it really kind of like sprung to my mind is Dalagoke does tell you to always position your body behind your parry, you know? Mm -hmm. And so when you are, a lot of times when he tells you to use that Gordy to test a parry, you are kind of like turning that back foot behind. And so you create this really dynamic and beautiful attacking opportunity on that outside line of your opponent, uh, which would be to the outside of their right side. Um, because you are kind of like turning your body and you are allowing everything to kind of like push away from you and you're creating this like sort of flanking opportunity for yourself. Um, and, and while that those mechanics do exist in some of the earlier texts like Murazzo and Manchialino, uh, they're not as, they, they, it's not, I wouldn't say that they have as much of a, a sword focus of kind of like making sure that a lot of your attacks finish with the sword. I think sometimes Murato and Manchialino have a tendency to kind of like create grappling opportunities a lot more right. than what we see in Dalagoke. So rather they would say, well, if I go on the inside and I give a cut like right through the center, then, you know, most likely my opponent's going to have to push over top of my sword. And then I'm just going to get, I'm going to have that wrap in the middle. And I'm now I've got them in, you know, a nice little arm bar and I've got control of them. Right. Where Dalagoke is like, I'm going to keep fighting with my sword, you know? And mm, so I think right. that's kind of the, a little bit of a tactical difference there though to be fair at his end of his like summary part on the defenses from any guard he goes 
uh, Cordelonga Alta, there comes the Mandrito, he goes, Guadi di Testa, and grabs the sword and strikes around. <laughs> yep, yep. So he, I mean, he definitely does, right? He like, he totally sets it up. Um, yeah, that's a, uh, that's actually, oh, I, I won't go into that, but <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> it will probably um, can go uh, a lot about these close plays as well for an own episode or something like that. Oh or, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. we could keep this going forever. <laughs> We're going to be, we got at least 30 of these. <laughs> Um, but hey, I mean, if you're up for it, yeah, I, I, I'm having a good time. Um, so, Gordia de Faccia, um, mm-hmm. get out of my face, right? Like, Gordia de Faccia, what is Gordia de Faccia? Yeah, so that would be the quarta in Italian rapier fencing. Basically, you're, basically the end position of the Punta Riversa, like I described it uh, last time, with the palm turned up. The true edge turned towards your non-dominant side, so as a right-hander that would be your left side, flats facing towards the sky and towards the ground, and your body in a really nice profile. It's here just as important as in Porta di Ferro Stretta. So you're really turning your left shoulder behind the sword and thrusting that blade towards the opponent's face, not towards your own. (laughs) Yeah. Steven, how about you? Uh, Yeah, so... My take on Guardia di Faccia is a bit different since I don't do Dalagokie. Um, so it's actually the fifth body position. So there's really four body positions in the in the canon, but there's really a fifth where your body is actually just in such a position that your hand and your both your hands are at the same length. Uh, and Guardia di Faccia, as I as is used in the Anonimo, is primarily appears in the use of sword and shield together, and mostly as a uh, retreating mechanisms. So you do some stuff, and then when it's time to get out of the game, you retreat and you thrust under your shield, be it a Targa, be it a Rotella, be it a Sword and Small Buckler, um, and you put your sword in their face, and they go, "Ooh, wait a sec!" You're just trying to you're trying to create pause. Um, so for me, the difference is that it's it is the fully extended. It's just a fully extended sword. It's also the equivalent to a long point. Uh, for uh, the guys in my Myers group. So when we're trying to discuss Guardia de Faccia, that's basically just sword extended all the way out, which is not useful particularly in the sword alone because that's essentially saying, I would like you to hit me in my hands. Would you be so kind, please? Yeah, well, I, I disagree on that last part for sure. Uh, okay. cool. <laughs> I do think that you use it a lot with, with sword alone, but then again, I also think that that's kind of like the position that you're trying to get to with Manchiolino sword alone. So from Porta de Ferrostrata, but generally you're rising up underneath. Like you're doing so because you're meeting somebody's attack. Um, so I guess like you wouldn't just like walk into somebody like holding Guardia de Faccia. Yeah, I, I mean you, that is, I mean, Metzit spotted to me as essentially when you're crossed at Guardia de Faccia. And just yeah, the yeah, variations yeah. of Guardia de Faccia crossing. Gotcha, yeah. Um, so I'm going to take, I'm actually going to take the middle ground on this one. I'm going to say... Like Stephen, you Boring. kind of went with more of a you went you went more with a like a heart open, right? That's Gordia uh-huh. Faccia, and I think that um, Martin went more with a, a chest to the side, um, kind of close uh-huh. profile with Gordia yeah. Faccia. I'm gonna say it's both. Yeah. So <clears throat> not necessarily boring, but there's there's one really beautiful play that uh, uh, Manchiolino, who is like, if you guys want a like oh shit like parry, this is your oh shit parry, like Gordia de Faccia. Like, for the most part, you can just go to Gordia de Facci and it'll parry most things. Like a Mandrito, um, you can use it to parry a Reverso. You can use it to parry a Thrust. Like, Gordia de Facci can basically parry anything. Um, as long as you're coming from a low guard, right? Just understand you're giving your opponent your sword. Like, yes, I am parrying and I want you to take hold of my sword and rip it from my hand. But it can get you that extra half second of survival. Or... Or you just know that, like, they're going to have to do something out of that. And if they don't, and if they just, you know, try to put pressure and, like, give you a strong overbind, then they're just inviting you to come in and wrestle. Right. Yeah, and, and stuff that's thrusts you... certainly are a thing in modern fencing still. So. Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> that's definitely <laughs> but, the position to go in. Right, and so that's – and, and um, Murato uses it that way. So that's one of his defenses from Cota Longa Alta. You're just basically stepping in. You're going, you know, you're just meeting your opponent, Gordia de Faccia, and giving him a stop thrust to the face. Um, you know, we see that a lot through a lot of the Bolognese authors. But so the reason I say it's both is Manchilino has this one play in particular where you're pairing a reverso with Gordia de Faccia, which 
mm-hmm. chest open, right? You've got your sure. uh, chest open and gordia de fagia, and then your opponent comes around and they try to give you a mandrito, and all you have to do to close that inside line is close the back foot. So yeah. let that heel drop down to yeah. the ground and turn to then a, a sort of a chest off to the side or that closed position yeah. um, that we'd see from like Porta de Ferrostrena. And you'll parry that Mandrito as well and stab them in the face in that contra tempo opportunity, right? So in that in that sort of stop thrust action. Yeah. Um, so that, that's really kind of the beautiful thing about Gordy de Faccia, especially as your opponent is attacking you in your upper quarters, is that it has this versatility where you can add a hip component and you can basically just keep everything closed off. And then if you need to, you can always transform that into Gordy de Testa or you can drop it down with a mezzo mandrito with just a simple half turn of the hand. So you can close uh, or a mezzo reverso, right? Like it, it kind of has right. this, it, it's like, uh, it's almost like the queen, if you will, of, of all your guards, uh, the way that I see it. And that um, once you've brought it to bear in the game, um, it starts to have a lot of versatility where it's just a simple half turn and you can cover any line. Yeah. So cool. Yeah. W- one last yeah. thing I would um, talk about very quickly is the body mechanics side of uh, the perspective, and that is if you want to exert force or push something. Um, imagine pushing against the ground. So you can have like three positions that are really stable. The first would be like your standard push-up position with both feet in the middle of your chest. You're pushing against the ground. It's fairly stable. You can push fairly well and especially for the two-handed sword this is like a usual a very common position to be in but then with the one-handed sword that becomes not so feasible anymore because well you have that like if you just push with one hand well your non-dominant shoulder wants to drop right right so what you're usually doing is getting into that profile position pushing through the back foot through the spine being a nice profile and you, just your your dominant hand, so the hand that is on the ground, and everything else is beh- uh, behind that. As soon as you're turning a bit your body, you have again that like twerk, that that uh, rotational force that you can't, um, that basically needs some kind of your energy to deal with. So it's always better, just in my opinion, to especially in Guardi di Faccia, being that nice frontal position have the right hand right in front of the right shoulder to just push forward with the hand towards the incoming force. So that could be still like a bit on the diagonal towards the the opponent's blow. And then your sword point can do whatever, right? But, But you want to really like push with your whole body into that blow. And that also means that if your right hand is right in front of your right shoulder, if the opponent disengages around, like your false edge is still covering you, you'd almost need don't need to turn your hand any anything you just need like the smallest turn of your body and your outside is already closed as soon as your hand drifts towards the inside that advantage goes away yeah that's actually um that's really interesting but and that's kind of what i was talking about uh with the coiling aspect mm-hmm. and i think that's because you you fence a lot because from dalagoki you probably fence a lot from cotolonga strata as well right and so like that's kind of your your idea of cordia de faccia because that is like that's like one of the things that's kind of built into Cota Longa Stretta um, with that Gordia de Faccia is like you're in a, a hips forward position in, Gord- in Cota Longa Stretta and when you send that Gordia de Faccia forward to, to make that parry, like you're just kind of like opening those hips up and like turning them in profile. Yeah. I think from from a, like a Porta de Ferro perspective though, if I was taking this from Mangialino, I would see it as I'm going from that hips off to the side position to then hips facing my opponent position. So my body position is changing. So then I am going to that open arm position, but that's where I need that to stop somewhere. So I need, um, because it's a reverso, I need to, uh, the reverso, like it's a mandrito, anything that crosses the body, right? Mm-hmm. Like with a mandrito is always going to have the pectoral muscle to stop the action. A reverso, however, doesn't have anything that's going to stop the action. So you have to use more of your muscle groups to kind of like stop where it's going. And that's kind of like, I think, the art a little bit of learning how to kind of like stop that cordia de facci without letting it drift. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the things, that's one of the reasons why I think Mancilino is very explicit about saying that that uh, his falso is stopping cordia de faccia, because otherwise that, that, that falso could go forever. Like if you chase your opponent's sword, it's going it's to keep going. All right, so, um, so, so you're basically talking about uh, Dalagokia's Guardi d'Entrave mechanics, uh, which, he, yeah. which he uses to deal with that kind of outside attack, 
while earlier authors still used just quality de Fraccia. So yeah, I, I right. agree. But you're of course then just again having your your right hand right in front of the right shoulder. So basically your left shoulder, right foot shoulder and the hand are forming one line towards the opponent yeah. because you're just twisting yourself. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And the, and right. the hips, mm -hmm. like you're still, you're, you're still keeping that structure, but it's the hips that are kind of yeah. actually allowing that to kind of turn. Okay. I completely yeah. agree. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, um, we had to lose, uh, Steven at the worst time possible. Cause now we're going to talk about Gordia de Entreri. Um, so let's, uh, enter into discussion on this one here, Martin. Um, Gordia de Entreri, what is it? Yeah. So with Giovanni della Gocchi, like I mentioned, it's like the counterpart of Guardi di Faccia. And he's very special in that one that I think all the other authors use in a different way. But for him, like Guardi di Faccia, that, that palm up kind of position, sword extended towards the opponent. And Guardi d'Entrare is basically palm down, turning your true edge towards the outside, still being somewhat in a kind of profile. But like we just discussed, having the left shoulder maybe a bit more up front than, than before to just withstand that pressure on the outside line. So that would be um, Dalagokia's kind of deal. And I think with uh, Marazzo, well, it's uh, usually some kind of variant on inside on the inside guard where you are raising your hand towards the high inside line. So basically like like a counterpart to Guardia Dalicorno or Becca Cesa, Becca Posa. So if you're drawing that symmetry line right down the middle, you're having that hand high on your left, sword pointing forward. Yeah, I think I think Morazzo makes this so much more complicated because his illustration is like really hard to kind of like decipher. Um, it looks like even between his two different texts, he has two different hand positions. Um, this is definitely one that we could kind of get into the weeds arguing about forever. Um, the Anonimo uses Gordia de Entreri a lot. And one of the things that Stephen wanted us to kind of point out is that it's like Gordia Alta, um, or Cotolonga Alta. And with the magic of post-editing, here are Stephen's thoughts. The Anonimo's equivalent to the Gordia de Entreri of Dalagokie is what the Anonimo calls Cotolonga Alta. The idea is similar. It is almost always used as the position for a true edge parry on the high outside line. In the fashion of the Anonimo Bolognese, the parry is formed by orienting the body, especially the belly button, in the direction of the attack. The true edge is placed over the attack with the blade angled somewhat toward the outside. In practice, I found that most people have the best success when the blade is halfway between a knuckles down position and a fingernails down position. The follow-up is naturally going to be a thrust. That's usually made with the left foot forward. One of the interesting things about this thrust in the Anonimo Bolognese is that in making this thrust, you're advised to pull your right foot near your left as you make the thrust. This way, you get that little extra bit of reach. This is just like how you turn your shoulder when making the thrust on the inside. The Anonimo uses this Guardia d'Entrare slash Cotolunga Alta Parry both as a single time defense and also as a parry riposte kind of action. You can use it as a two-tempo defense when you are in Porta di Ferro Stretta, for example. When an opponent attacks, simply make a half turn of the body and extend your sword a bit over the opponent's attack. Then make your thrust as you pass left. The Anonimo also provides a description of a single-time counterattack where you make the half turn of the hand while stepping with your left foot, and then you go ahead and pull your right foot near to your left as you make the thrust. As to the attacks from Guardia d'Entrare slash Cotolunga Alta, I can only remember one attack, and that is an imbrocata, which for some reason goes to Guardia di Sopra Braccio, that is, over your left elbow. That is then followed by a punta reversa or an imbrocata reversa, essentially an imbrocata that goes from left to right. I've never done this with the sword alone, but Manchelino has something similar during the second verse of his first assalto for the sword and the small buckler. And that's what Bolognese swordsmanship is all about. Reading the sources for techniques, connecting techniques between different authors, then hitting your friends with said techniques. One of the things I think that we need to emphasize is that there isn't agreement between the Bolognese authors at all on on what Gordé de Entreri is. Um, it seems like, uh, you know, obviously Dalagokie uses it more like Seconda, um, and we see that that mechanic of that Seconda parry used a lot in other systems. Um, whereas 
I see Gordy Dancheri a lot from like the other authors, almost like it's kind of, honestly, I know when I say this, some people might cringe, but I always see it kind of like you're giving a deliberate week, like you're stopping something on the inside, like on the left. But it's like you're doing so in a way where you're giving somebody a deliberately weak angle. So that way it's almost like a Copal de Villiano type mechanic Mm -hmm. um, to take something from Fiore where you're just trying to get around to their outside. And it's almost like a reverse Delagoki Gwydi de Testa where you're just trying to like create a wall between you and your opponent so that way you can then step around to their outside. Um, I don't know. I think there are a lot of different ways to look at it. I think uh, Manchelino described that mechanic at least as well when he says like you parry in Guardi di Faccia and they basically break through your the, the true edge of your blade and you duck underneath it and then you strike around with your reverso. So that's kind of that mechanic that is described. Yamarazzo really makes it makes it hard to deal with because uh, in his uh, depiction with a single sword, the the grip on the sword is drawn really weirdly. So that would be like a kind of Thibaut grip, which is yeah, um, like a handshake grip almost. Yeah, it's yeah. it's it's with the with the index finger wrapped around the cross, but the thumb is on the same side. So it's like kind of that weird mix between a thumb grip and like the fingering grip. So for that grip, like his false edge would be still pointing towards his inside, and his true edge would be pointing towards his his outside. But he parries on the inside. So yeah, it's it's. It's kind of weird, but um, yeah. with the two-handed sword, it becomes a bit more clearer because there it's like like that usual uh, left ox kind of guard uh, with the with the hands held up high towards the upper left, and the swords just pointing towards the opponent. Yeah, and that's that's when it really starts to look like Fiori. Obviously, you've got much yeah. more of a direct influence there because you're talking about a two-handed sword. But yeah, with the the single-handed sword, it's a a little more unclear. I I. I love the mechanic of Dalagokie's Gorde de Entrary, though. Like, it, it's one of my, like, it, it's a bread and butter action later on that we see for a reason. Like, there's this, like, you were talking about the hip mechanic with Gorde de Testa in particular, and you kind of get that that turn, and you can just go straight into Gorde de Testa, or in the um, Gorde de Entrary, and start to get some counterattacking opportunities out of that. I think he usually thrusts, like, an imprecata out of that, right? Like, it's like you meet them in the middle in Gorde de Entrary, which is kind of like a higher um, get Cota Longa Strata Alta, I guess, mm-hmm. you know, um, and and uh, you can put it in a palm down position. And then you can go ahead and start to rotate that up and you can grab your opponent's sword with the quillions of your sword or the cross guard of your sword will kind of like lock into your opponent um, as you're starting to turn that up into an imprecata. Um, and it's, it's really beautiful. Um, you know, there's a lot of kind of like deeper mechanics you can play with and get into. Um, yeah, certainly. It's a really interesting guard. And for Marazzo, it's actually one of his favorite in the two-handed sword section, where he not only uses it to like that bread and butter motion of cutting around, but he also like, um, after throwing a drito, he just draws the sword back and then thrusts above, turning the hands again, closing the opponent out to the outside, which is also really beautiful and also a really nice follow-up action when you are going for that lag. You are covering high. You're drawing the sword back, and then you are thrusting in again, and throwing a couple of mandriti f- uh, for for good exercise behind them. Yeah, and and then you know we also see, uh, and this is this is where it kind of gets infinitely complicated. But with the anonimo, it's his favorite cover. So mm-hmm. a lot of times he finishes his actions, or even like thrusts in Gordia de Entrere. Um And I wish we had Stephen for this, but. Um, you know, it is like he had described it almost like a Porta de Ferro Alta kind of thing. Um, but you're allowing that back leg a lot of times to turn, like there's a turning, a body turning mechanic. So it's almost like uh, you go from a shoulder profile to the side position, almost to like shoulder reaching across. So it's like you bring that back leg back, and now it's like you're you're kind of almost like leaning into that that position there, and it allows for a really dynamic cover and a lot of structure and posture behind that cover um when you can give that gordia de entrary thrust or um parry uh but it is it, it does take it's not i don't i don't know if it's quite in corta um so mm-hmm. we see that there's an in corta parry that we see in the rapier traditions 
Um, and I think sometimes people kind of exaggerate it a little bit to almost an encorta type position. Um, yeah, the, the, the typical encuartata, which uh, where yeah. you are almost like turning your back towards the opponent. <laughs> right. It looks le um, really nice. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Paladini and Agrippa have a thing that they do um, where instead of allowing the back foot to turn so much that the back turns towards the opponent, uh, they actually step out with the right leg when they go mm -hmm. into that in Corta. So they're actually stepping into it with the, the right leg um, instead. And that defies how uh, the Anonimo kind of describes it a little bit because it's usually the, the left leg following the right foot. Yeah. But it could be, I don't know. Yeah, Fabris and Capoferro do that as well with both feet. They just do, uh, they call it differently. It's, I think, it's Ganso de la Vita or something like that. So, void of the body. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Very nice. Um, cool. So, I mean, yeah, unfortunately, Gordet Entre is one that, um, you know, will probably take some study in trying to understand from a foundational perspective. Unfortunately, it, it really depends on what author you're looking at. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Maitrelino is like, I don't even bother. <laughs> yeah, definitely. If you're doing any author, you should look at what they have to say about Guadentra and just go from there because it's not that uniform as the other guards are. Yeah, true. All right, so let's talk about um, Soprabaccio. So, Oprah? <laughs> yeah, Soprabaccio. Um, basically, it's just the opposite of Sotobraccio, which is over the hand. So if you imagine having a buckler in your left hand, and now your your sword is on the left shoulder, so basically somewhere above your left hand, then it's probably in Soprabaccio. From there, of course, um, there are a great many of Reverso that you could throw, which would be the most common attack, but um, you shouldn't discard the Mandrito or any kind of Tramazzona as well. Yeah, yeah, Michelino actually, you know, he's he's very liberal with how he attacks from from Soprabaccio. He's uh, He's, he's got a lot of, of really interesting um, kind of play that he takes from there. He even thrusts a, a Punto Reversa from there. Mm -hmm. um, so he's got a lot of kind of really cool actions and there's a lot you can do with your footwork. But yeah, it, it's, um, it is interesting because, um, again, you've got your point offline, so it's pointed behind you, um, which is a, a powerful position. I mean, it's a, it's a chambered action, um, you know, uh, what I was talking about earlier with some of the Anonymous left versus right plays, he does these falsos uh, because like if you were in Cota Longa Strata and you were to throw a falso at a left-handed person's hand, right? You might strike the outside of their hand, but you're chambering a reverso in the same action. It goes sopra brachio, so now it's over your shoulder. And you come straight back down with a reverso on the other side. And they probably have to withdraw their hand, so they're already behind in tempo. And now they're bringing their point back to the middle, which now you're dominating with a really powerful reverso mm -hmm. that's coming across your body. And it's it's a really uh, interesting mechanic that the Anonymous likes to play with. Um, and he does it with a sword alone. So um, something that's kind of interesting. But um, yeah, it, it's definitely a really versatile card. I wouldn't hold it with uh, with sword alone very often. It's not something I would, I would generally recommend. Um, I don't think any of the, the authors would. I think it's used very sparingly. Um, it is a, a position, like I said, with against the left-hander in particular. Uh, I think that's a very specialized action, so don't get me wrong and think, hey, I can use Soprabrachio all the time. Um, but with Soprabrachio, it is one of those things where uh, you are exposing your elbow to your opponent. Uh, so, like, because your arm is up over your shoulder, you're basically presenting your elbow as, as, as something for your opponent to attack. Um, and if you don't have something to protect yourself, you're going to get hit. Yeah, definitely. Marozzo actually uses this one kind of with a two-handed sword as well. And as yeah. he describes this as Guardia di Gombito, so like elbow guard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah. that after throwing a Mandrito, he goes into there. And from there, he then again throws another Reverso to go back into the line. But yeah, if, imagine like you're pulling your Mandrito all the way through above your left shoulder. Then you're probably in that kind of guard. Yeah, nice. Um, so just to wrap this up, I want to kind of talk about something um, and a way to kind of condense this all down. So um, one of the things that uh, Vigiani is really good at, um, this is where I think Vigiani is really important because he talks about the nature of the cards. So, you know, you have offensiva perfecta, you have defensiva perfecta. Um, and I've condensed everything down kind of into just a general admonition of like good practice, 
of how to read people when they're in a guard. Because one of the things that we have to kind of get used to is we're fencing is like, if you start just going through and saying that person is in Cordia de Soprabracchio in your head, you're going to get lost. You know, like analytically, you can't do that when you're fencing. Like you need to break things down into a faster mode. Um, so uh, if, if people check out our, our sub stack, there's an article that I wrote about, about the guards, but um, to kind of break this down and using like everything that we just talked about, about the general nature of the guards, um, this is what I, I come, come, come up with. It's like six things to look out for. So is their sword on the left or the right, right? If their sword is on the left, they're defensive. If their sword is on the right, they're offensive. That comes from uh, Vigiani. He talks about how if the sword is on the left, it's defensive. If it's on the right, it's offensive. Um, so, you know, nothing too controversial there um, in terms of, like, what we're talking about. Um, the next bit comes from Manchialino, but is their sword high or low? Um, if it's high, it's offensive. Um, if it's low, it's defensive, right? So, um, you know, it's uh, – that's – Michelino says that, you know, the, the high guards are good for attacking, the low guards are good for defending, and the only natural attack from a low guard is a thrust, right? So you can see how you can start to just, like, by condensing this down and having this more tactical approach, you can have a view of how to quickly read what's going to happen, what's going to come from your opponent's guard. Because if it's anything outside of the norm or what would be natural, then generally it's going to come with a bigger tempo. So it's easier to read. Right, so if your opponent defies convention, they are basically saying they're gonna have to they're gonna have to show you. So from a best practice perspective, this kind of helps you with that. And then of course, we talked about whether or not the point is online or offline, and what the sword can do. Where if the point is offline, it's most likely gonna be a cut. Right, it can be a thrust, but again, they're gonna have to do the natural thing, which is turn the hand, which is a tempo, to bring the point online to the thrust. And then um, if it's online then it can give both a thrust and a cut. So you have six basic things that you can look for uh, with your opponent is, is their opponent, is their sword on the left or the right? Is it high or low? Is the point online or offline? And if you look at those six things, um, you can generally tell what is going to happen uh, and, and how you, you'll know how to, how to attack your opponent, right? Because if they're in an offensive guard, then they're not going to be good at giving defense, right? Um, if their point is offline, then you know that they're going to have to deliver a cut, which means that um, you know it's falsata and, and feints and things like that are, are really nice because that's a big tempo coming through. So I mean, there's a lot you can kind of like really kind of like dig into that a little bit further to get into the tactics, which we'll get into in the next episode. But uh, what do you think about that, Martin? Yeah, I really think that uh, some of the, the tactical approach uh, that the guards and the attacks um, are starting here quite nicely. Because, well, these are positions from where we are fighting and that has, uh, has not to be forgotten. So we are always want to fulfill a purpose with a kind of movement, a kind of guard. And I really think that the guards that are named out here from the different authors, well, these are just like their way of fighting. They're, like I said, they present to us lots of data, a lot of kind of information about that particular author, author like to fight. Because Vijani also says, well, there are an infinite amount of guards because every infinitesimal movement, any, any position could be named. And he goes on a great uh, turret about calling them with animals, uh, like Falcone, Alicorn or something like that. So. Yeah. <laughs> even referencing Vadi in there somewhere. So, um, and he wants to, to get you to think just about the essence because he wants, uh, he also describes that he doesn't want to teach you for a whole year, but just want to, wants you to, to understand the essence of his fencing play. So yeah, I think, um, if we're talking about the, the general Bolognese guards, it's, it's great if you, if you can memorize that any part of the Ferro guard is on the inside. Any Coda Longa guard is on the outside. Then there's a bit of shenanigans which leg is forward, but um, usually with Porta di Ferro, the right leg is forward. Cingaro Porta di Ferro, the left leg is forward. With Coda Longa, it's a bit strange again. And then there's uh, another modifier here, which is Alta, Stretta, or Larga, which describes the height of the hand, basically. And then we have a bunch of high guards, which are fairly self-explanatory, like 
Guardia Alta, it's the high guard, the guard of the unicorn. Okay, well, that's with a point forward. <laughs> <laughs> and Testa protects the head. Faccia, it's also with the point forward and protects the face very well. And Guardia Entrado, well, you better look at your author. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, I'm, I think that's the perfect way to wrap it up. That was, that was awesome. Um, thanks again, Martin. And uh, we'll see you again for the next episode. Yeah, see you next time.